Bless you. Thank you, Brussels. My first time here, I think. Is it? I think it's my first time in Brussels. Unless someone has seen me before here. <laughs> there were some lost years. Ah, all of, all of you guys Can are you here. see them? Yes, I can. I can. And you I can all came out on a, on, a, on a beautiful Sunday. I noticed there were no cars in the street. What's up with that? That's all because of you and your visit. <laughs> Was it because of me? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and you drive at a certain pace. Yeah, th this is also all because of you. We organized it, especially I Car Free thought, Sunday. I thought we were going to run over 40 people on our way here. Is that how we, that's how you drive here, more or less? Everyone just walks in the street and does this things. This is because of this, uh, this Sunday, yeah. Ah, uh, so, hello. Hello, hi. We friend. didn't get to f uh, formally meet backstage. Uh, let's let's I shake hands. I was then. a little, uh, hello. I was a little, um, I've been traveling all day, and then I was in the hotel doing... A lot interview of interviews, after interview. and, so it's, yeah. uh, and then straight here, and so it's been uh, a little crazy, but we're good. Shall we start? We shall. Good evening, everyone. Goeie avond, bonsoir. We will do this in English. Um, of course, I can actually see practically nobody except from the first row, so I will be looking at you. My name is Ine Rox. I'm a Belgian journalist. I work for a newspaper called The Standard, and I, among other things, write about the United States. Uh, very privileged and happy to be here with you, uh, Brett. Um, first of all, I don't have to introduce who you are, author of six uh, novels, most famously for uh, American Psycho, of course, and Less Than Zero. Welcome to Brussels. Uh, on this occasion, we will be, will be talking mostly about um, this new book, your first uh, non-fiction book called White. Very interesting combination of many things. Um, extremely funny, I thought, at uh, many times also sometimes. Uh, very enraged, uh, 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 angry. A lot of autobiographical elements to it and uh, criticism of uh, our culture and uh, provocative writing, of course, uh, about how we got here uh, in 2019. Of course, uh, funny when you're uh, writing about millennials uh, that you call Generation Wuss. A lot of comments about that. I love them. <laughs> I love millennials. Well, you love especially one of them, right? Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> First question is, um, yes. at the beginning of this book, let's start with the beginning. Um, instead of the overprotective helicopter parents that many millennials had uh, looking out for them there every step of the way and putting everything on Facebook, every important and less important life phase, your childhood uh, that you talked to us about at the beginning of the book, your childhood be being brought up in uh, LA, um, your parents, they weren't exactly helicopter parents were no. they they no. were not so overprotective and then you started watching horror movies a lot of them yes that's true <laughs> tell us about that i mean it is strange uh to look back on my childhood and realize that there were not a lot of adults present and that as a child you were living in a world that was made for adults it was not a world made for kids. I don't think I ever remembered my parents asking me, oh, do you want this? Do you want to see this movie? Do you want to eat this? You pretty much did what they said. And they didn't really say a lot. So I remember me and my friends being on our own a lot when I was a kid in LA. I remember that my father, for example, I might not have seen him all week. Uh, he went to the office early in the morning. He came home late at night. Uh, I don't know where my mother was, but um, I don't know where my friends' mothers were, but we were often in empty houses and we were playing outside on uh, neighborhood streets and up into the canyons where I lived, up into the hills. And it was pretty much, um, we were pretty much not watched at all. I mean, I walked to school at five, I walked to school at six, I walked to school at seven, along with other five-year-olds and six-year-olds. No one batted an eye, no one was worried about anything happening to you. What this ultimately did was, I think, foster a kind of independence. It made us grow up in a way that I'm not quite sure the millennial generation ultimately did, where they were very protected in a way, and they were, it was all about safety and safe spaces, and also, um, you know, uh, almost like staying a child forever in many ways. Um, you were kind of forced to grow up 
in, in the world that me and my friends grew up in because who else was going to help you? You know, we were, we were pretty much on our own. And that, that also extended, in a way, to the entertainment that we watched, which led us to the first chapter, which is about how, uh, how many horror movies that I was able to how see. How many did you see? Oh, I, hundreds when <laughs> I was a kid. And, and they were often res restricted in the United States, meaning rated R. And it was just a moment where it was a very, um, I don't know what, you, how do you say, a, a lax, lax world, a relax, let's say relax world. And you kind of just moved around as a kid from place to place to place to place. And you kind of started rising toward an adulthood that you actually wanted. I mean, I remember wanting to become an adult. I wanted to enter into the world of a, an adult. I didn't want to stay a kid forever. Do, do I, you think millennials don't want to move into adulthood because you say they are obsessed with victimhood. Can I, you explain why you think they are? Okay, I got into a lot of trouble with this book because of a, a, a section on millennials that had really actually, I think, been published about three or four years ago in Vanity Fair. And my jokey attitude about millennials started when I began dating one. And we were often at odds about what was worthy of being triggered and what offended him or bothered him and what offended me, which was nothing, and what triggered me, which was nothing. I wasn't triggered by anything. I wasn't offended by anything. And it was funny. And so on Twitter, I started to um, uh, write these tweets about the differences between me and my partner. And it was under the hashtag Generation Wuss. And it was supposed to be funny. It wasn't supposed to be super serious. It was just like what Twitter was, which was a fun place to make jokes and make snarky observations like that. And then I did write about it in, in this article. But I also wrote, and this is what most of the millennials who have been criticizing this book seem to forget, is that I'm very sympathetic because I live with one. And I have two pages where I talk about why I'm so sympathetic to millennials. Uh, because of all of the crap they've had to deal with, with social media, a president they hate, two wars, whatever, in terms of American millennials. So I've been, and, and also a terrible economic strain and uh, college debt and all of this stuff. Um, so I've been very sympathetic to them, but yet the, neg the negative stuff is what is mostly referenced when I'm, when I'm interviewed. Um, but um, uh, I think there is a difference in terms of the way that Todd, my partner, deals with the world in a way that I do, which is normal because we're from different generations, and so that's just how it is. But I, I understand why millennials are the way they are, and I am not at all, like, uh, hate them or anything like you, that. You mentioned Twitter, and um, you seem to suggest that there is a, an evolution in, in, in the way Twitter used to be or what it was supposed to be used for. Um, you say... You write a lot of uh, times, how can opinions be wrong? You get attacked for an opinion on Twitter. You say, it's just an opinion. I'm not saying it's factual. I can also change my opinion. And I was wondering, um, does it throw you back to the heavy reactions before American Psycho got published? When you were held responsible for what the main character, Patrick Bateman, does, says, and thinks, um, the publisher bailing out uh, on you two months before publication, then actually... Um, I forgot that you also received death threats over it. Is, is there a link um, in a way that then you felt misunderstood? You felt that you had to explain why the character is the character, that that is not you, in the same way you say my Twitter personality is not my whole or my own personality? Well, Twitter isn't real. Twitter isn't real, and when Twitter first started out and I first joined it, it was kind of the Wild West. It was very fun. You set outrageous things. You got a reaction from people. Uh, people screamed, people shouted, you tweeted something else. It was all really kind of fun. Twitter was really fun, and I had a lot of dumb tweets, and I tweeted a lot of dumb shit, but, um, and some of them got, I noticed that they became increasingly, as Twitter got older, that these tweets and the tweets of my friends became more controversial and more and more people were getting upset by them or most importantly, not upset, offended, offended. And this, offend, this offended reaction to tweets became something 
really surprising to me because Twitter, I thought, encouraged that. It encouraged this notion that you can say whatever you want on this platform, and that's what it was built for. And it, I became aware at a certain point that people were getting more and more offended by things, as if being offended by things was bad. I don't think being offended by something is bad. I kind of want to be offended. I want to be offended by comedy. I want to be offended by opinions. I, I've always searched that out my whole life. And I think as a member of Gen X, that was just part of our deal. I mean, we, we encouraged it. We didn't give, as I write in the book, as Joan Jett saying, I don't give a damn about my reputation. You know, I think we were cold and nihilistic and like negative comedy and, and all of this stuff. And I started to notice that there was a shift in the culture where people became offended by an opinion, offended by a joke, offended by, you know, uh, a review of something, your take on a movie. And Twitter evolved into a kind of virtue signaling machine where people were using it as a way to show off their best assets, to show off how sensitive they were, to show how much they cared about things. And how much of a victim they were, how much they were hurt by things. And that's a very cheap and easy way to get followers and to get likes and to have people then follow you and retweet you and you know like you. And, and that, that's, that is night and day between what Twitter started out as mm -hmm. and where it has now ended up. But there are also a lot of people now on Twitter voicing controversial opinions. Poli uh, mostly it's mo not politically correct. So. No, but the, the controversial opinions are political. It's all, Twitter is completely a politicized thing now. And it, it, it wasn't that at the beginning. Oh, it wasn't then at all because, mm -hmm. well, Trump wasn't there. But the, the, mm -hmm. the political, the politis, it was the politis, politicalization of, of everything. Is of everything. Of everything. And what happened, what, what is now, I mean, the battle on Twitter now and what is considered offensive, no one dares make offensive jokes about sex or race or whatever on Twitter anymore. But the, the, the offense is usually about two factions now who battle it out yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. But uh, going back to the atmosphere around American Psycho, like, are, are times, were times really that much tolerant back then if the publisher backed out because it was controversial, etc.? Like, a better can, publisher can came in. Yeah. A better publisher came in. A more prestigious publisher came in to publish American Psycho. That would not happen now. American Psycho wouldn't be published now. Uh, none of the big five publishers in the U.S. would dare take this on. And I think of an Why not? Why not? Uh, because of its content. And I think because that it is... American Psycho is a metaphor. Patrick Bateman is a metaphor. He's not a real thing. He's not a real person. He, is a, he represents all of these things that I had problems with about class, capitalism, Wall Street, greed, the Reagan 80s. And his acts were also metaphors. They were metaphors encased in a novel. I don't think we do metaphor anymore, at least not in the United States. People can't make that leap that Patrick Bateman is a metaphor for something. They would take it literally, that a depiction of misogyny, a depiction of sexual assault, is in fact now an act of sexual assault and an act of racism and an act of um, whatever else is on Patrick Bateman's list, homophobia, racism, sexism, the whole thing. And I think people don't, look at the world that way. They look at it in a very literal-minded way. And I think metaphor, the idea that a joke could mean also this, or uh, a tweet could also mean this, is gone. And we're now in a very literal-minded society that doesn't see um, what F. Scott Fitzgerald, for example, said was the most important thing that a human being could have. The ability to look at two sides of an issue that you might totally disagree with and understand the other side. Mm -hmm. He says something about how you, to be a fully intelligent human, you have to look at a rose and see both the beauty of it and the horror of it as well. Because it can hurt you. Yeah. 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 Well, you say in, in, in American Psycho, you mention uh, Donald Trump, I think about 40 times you right now uh, in, uh, in white. Um, somehow then you saw it coming. Patrick Bateman is super fascinated by uh, the businessman Donald Trump. Um, so you saw before 2016, you call the 2016 climate uh, American Psycho on steroids in New York. You saw it coming, that vast groups of people could love him. 
why don't you elaborate that a little more in the book? Like, Does why anybody don't really want me to? Does anybody really want well, I would, to talk about Donald Trump? I would love to hear Trump? that, yeah. Well, two-thirds of uh, the novel, are, of the book, are about him. I so. know. Well, look, when I was writing American Psycho, I initially was doing research by hanging out with young Wall Street guys. And I was kind of amazed at how many of them, this was in 1986, 87, a very long time. Many of you were probably not born then. And I was kind of amazed that they were all really obsessed with Donald Trump. And you have to remember, he was much better looking then. He was kind of this ideal older guy for a younger kind of businessman. You know, regardless if he had been, he was married at the time to, I believe Ivanka, or Ivana, Ivana, Ivana. Yeah. Ivana. And um, he was, and yet he, he still was seen around with uh, other, you know, models. Um, he had this lifestyle. He had a, the number one bestseller of that year, The Art of the Deal. And many of these men I knew aspired to be him. And I thought that's so funny because I couldn't really grasp the interest in Donald Trump. I was more pretentious and I was... Uh, uh, you know, a novelist, and I, my heroes were other people rather than this kind of vulgarian businessman that was tooling around New York. And so I did fold him into American Psycho where he became kind of the father that Patrick Bateman never had. And Patrick Bateman throughout the novel is always wondering about Donald Trump and thinking about him and wondering what his favorite restaurant is and can he get into the same party that Donald Trump is in. And then near the end of the novel, he's just walking up to Trump Tower and staring at it on, you know, on Fifth Avenue and just spacing out on it and thinking about killing people. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I think part of what happened with me is that I got rid of whatever my irritation with Donald Trump was then. And I kind of dealt with it. And I thought it was funny and I thought, okay, this is just a joke that you know people will either understand or not understand years from now. Um, but that was why he was there. I can't take credit for being prescient because mm. who, who would have possibly thought that he would have become president? But what do you, th what, what do you think? Didn't. What do you think attracts? Um, well, we can we can understand why the rich yuppies in Wall Street then in the '80s looked up to him because he was then. Well, he tried to portray himself as a successful businessman, going bankrupt uh, six times. Um, but, but what he, could uh, but what could attract a housewife in Pennsylvania, a steel worker, uh, somebody who's out of a job in rural Ohio? What, where is the appeal for those people? Do you think? Um, I think that there's this no bullshit attitude about him, even when he's bullshitting, where he comes off as a, an every guy and every dude who also is, pretends to be this billionaire, and is attractive to a large part of our country. Or at least, if not attractive, more attractive than what the alternative was, which was ultimately not attractive to two-thirds of the electoral college. Um, but I, you know, there, look, you know, you can say uh, that Donald Trump was put in the White House by 10 white racist sheriffs from the South, but he wasn't. He was put in there by 63 million people. Mm -hmm. So there, I mean, that's, there's got to be some kind of appeal. And I also want to say that it wasn't the rich people of Wall Street who found him attractive. It was kind of the nouveau riche young mm -hmm. Wall Street guys like Patrick Bateman who found Donald Trump attractive. I think he was always seen with a certain kind of skepticism yeah. and suspicion by the wealthy or, or the elite. I also think that, um, that that might have also helped move him forward politically because there's a lot of skepticism about the elite. Mm -hmm. What I found, uh, what I- This is so serious. What I, what I could recognize, well, it's about your book. <laughs> What I could recognize um, very much was um, the California bubble. Um, you live in blue California and you get yes. numerous examples of um, when you're on the, on, on the Trump loving list, how difficult life becomes. You will not get invited to certain parties. If you want to be an actor in a certain movie, you have to watch your bag. Uh, it goes very far. People are defriending each other. Can, can you explain a little bit what was the most remarkable story you heard uh, of friends and acquaintances in uh, getting... Uh, they keep coming. They keep coming. I don't know if anyone noticed that two weeks ago, Deborah Messing and uh, Eric McCormick, who are the stars of the show Will and Grace, 
put out tweets about a Donald Trump fundraiser and said, will the Hollywood Porter please go to this fundraiser and post a list of the people who are there so we know who to work with and who not to work with? We are in a liberal McCarthyism right now in Hollywood, in California. That is really scary. And I, I don't know why the left went so completely nuts over the election of this president, but they did. And I do detail in white how I believe they've kind of destroyed themselves in a way. And that the reaction to him could have been fine. It sucks. We'll give it a shot in 2020. But they didn't. The media broke down. The media melted into a kind of oblivion. I mean, if Trump's approval rating in America is at whatever, 44, 50%, 52, whatever it is, the American, me the American media is about at 17 or 16. I mean, so we're in this weird kind of rabbit hole where the American media, whose approval rating is at about 16, is constantly complaining about Donald Trump, whose approval ratings are about 50 or 55, and within his own party is about at 96 or 98. That's a strange thing. That's a strange world to live in when you open up the papers and see the media every day and see this kind of disconnect between what the reality is and what this manufactured narrative that the media has been creating for now three years. That is also, that I kind of knew was fake. My boyfriend bought into it. My boyfriend believed in Russian collusion. My boyfriend believed that Stormy Daniels was going to bring down Trump, that Michael Avenatti was going to bring down Trump, that it was all going to happen, that this whole thing this whole the, the the women's the first women's march was going to you know bring down trouble or the second women's march but the second women's march collapsed into this infighting between all of the women about identity politics and who's who's a racist who's a Jew who's not and there wasn't one so we're in a the the Trump has kind of decimated this ideal this liberal idealism that I believed in hmm. that I believed in as a kid and I and I talk about this how, how I do believe that my liberalism as a 70s kid, and especially as a gay man through the 80s and into the 90s, I can't believe that I ended up somewhere in the middle of the aisle. I'm not a conservative, I'm not a Republican, I'm not gonna vote for Trump, but I'm also not gonna let my life be destroyed by Donald Trump. And I think vast factions of the US have allowed themselves to be destroyed by Trump. And I think it means something very bad for this next election, which I think, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I think could have been won if something else had been taking place these past would, years. It would have changed in the meantime, yes. It would have um, changed. And I just think it's, it's a terrible thing. And I don't know what's going to happen to people yeah. in 2020. You s no, that sounded very serious, Brett. I know. I mean, it's, th but this is what happens when Trump comes in. And I always tell interviewers, I always say, okay, if you have the, uh, well, you offered me a chance to talk uh -huh, to you before. I did, did. I did. And I said, so. I, I don't want to talk before I don't want to hear the questions and you I You can ask me whatever you want. <laughs> You're right. And I would have said, let's save Trump for last. Because at, once you mention Trump, it's sort of like half the audience is already no, like... No, no, no. We're, we're going we're, 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 we're gonna to talk about other stuff, too. Um, you wanted to uh, talk about some hilarious uh, stuff. And the book is mainly when you mention your boyfriend getting outraged and upset and it dominates the whole weekend when for example Supreme Court Justice Kennedy announces his retirement he has a fit he has a 48 hour hysteria um, how, how do you of course that I mean I, I was laughing out loud reading that but how do you deal with that in in your household is it still fun to talk about my partner's a lot more fun than that okay he really is we've been together 10 years okay I point out certain things that made me a little annoyed and that I found funny about him in this book, but more or less, he's incredibly intelligent and very funny and smart. It's just when it comes down to Trump, he's a mess. <laughs> and he doesn't, I don't think he gets it the way I do. I see Trump as this kind of hyper real, absurd figure that uh, is a symptom of where America is mm. and that we kind of deserve him. And he's much more idealistic and believes that, you know, there was a coup. Somehow there was a coup. And that, that's why this man is in the White It's completely nuts. It's completely nuts. But going back to what you said, there is a long section in this book where I, that's pretty personal, where I detail what it's like to live among the elite in L.A., and seeing these very wealthy people have these, what I thought were quite amusing breakdowns over Donald Trump. And in very fancy restaurants, and very fancy hotels. And it was kind of a continuation of my fiction. It was a continuation of the elite people that I write about in my fiction, except this was real. And these were, uh, it, and it almost seemed kind of more crazier 
than 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 these depictions of the elite of my fiction is. But anyway, that's. Uh, but yeah. there is something behind it, maybe. Um, last question about Trump, um, about uh, the society as a whole. Um, there is maybe something behind their anger and their frustration. Of course. Um, there is fear of losing certain rights. Of course. Uh, gay rights, women's rights, a Supreme Court that is now conservative probably for the next 40, 50 years. That is something to deal with. The immigrant community is terrified about raids. People are saying outrageous things. Like I read that immigrants are telling each other that there are helicopters taking the kids at night. So there is a, a psychosis that is real. But you are reading an, a part of the media and I'm reading another part of the media. I watched the last Trump rally down in New Mexico where there were uh, a huge amount of Mexican legal immigrants yeah. no, I know them too. Yeah. screaming, build the wall, build mm. the wall. The mainstream media doesn't cover that. There, it's a very complicated thing. The mainstream media feeds these stories about immigration policies that were really not that different from Obama's and demonize them because it's Trump. And it is kind of a game to play as someone who is neutral and in the aisle and watching both of these things. I mean, we often have in my house MSNBC, which is the liberal channel uh, of, of, of the United States, and we also compare it. Todd will turn on Fox, mm -hmm. and we'll see the 6 o'clock news, and we'll watch one from the living room, one from my office. Two different worlds. The two extremes, absolutely. Two, uh, no. That's the right word, extremes. But they are two extremes. They're but there extremes. is also, for example, Brett, there is radio. I don't think NPR, national radio, fits into that category in those two extremes. They are nuanced and they also rightfully so criticized policy when it was Obama and now when it's Trump. No? You're talking mainly about television. I, I yeah, I think so. But I also know that television got, I mean, my boyfriend likes MSNBC, the liberal channel, but he also stopped watching it after the Mueller report came out because okay. he believed the Mueller report was going to save the United States and it was going to get Trump out of office. And for two and a half years, he had listened to this media entity tell us that. Mm -hmm. Two and a half years of this fake story that they were selling nightly to my boyfriend who believed in this fake narrative. I don't know. When people say, how dare you say something's fake news when the mainstream media, if you live in the United States, you are dealing with fake news on a daily basis, whether it's CNN, the New York Times, or MSNBC, as well as a hyperbolic Fox network. We, and my boyfriend has now moved into this alt-left place, this dark alt-left world where he hates everything that's mainstream liberal. And it's all about, like, everything is bad about um, the mainstream liberal media and mainstream liberal celebrities, and it's all a bunch of robotic nonsense and, and uh, slogans and stuff. So I don't know. Something has happened profoundly mm. since 2015. Mm -hmm. Oh, how depressing. Can it come together? You say start a conversation at least, get a whiskey oh, yeah, no, and talk to each other. Is that still possible? All the time. We talk to each other. You mean me and Todd? <laughs> no. Oh, who? I mean the two Americas, the two sides of the country. It's do terrible. You see, do it's you see people getting at least together? It's a truly or? terrible thing to witness. However, I think online there's more of a active hatred back and forth. But I have seen people get together who are like Todd meeting someone I know who's a millennial. We have a friend who's Todd's age who looks exactly like Todd, who's 33, Jewish. They, the first time they met, they just stared at each other. They couldn't believe they looked like. And he was a Trump supporter. He's Jewish. He's pro-Israel. He's pro-Netanyahu. And Todd is not any of these things. And they, they started out at each other in a, in a weird way, and then they found that they had common experiences, common things besides politics and this yeah. political thing. And it's true. For some reason, in my entire lifetime, I've never seen politics divide a country the way that this has. It hasn't, you say, not before. It hasn't not before. Divided. It no. wasn't at all, no. no. Uh, well, I'm also, my, my mom is old enough to remember that 1968... She yeah. said that was bad. The, what we're living the, through the now Nixon is just times? Yeah. well. She's talking about well, well, the the Nixon election of 1968. I mean, she said 68 was this apocalyptic year of assassinations and riot, and riots, and actual riots, yeah. And, yeah. Pe and then through that, you know, whatever. She said this is just annoying people fighting with each other. But 68 was uh, apocalyptic compared to what this is now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, 
going further on 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 the media, uh, Brad, um, you say uh, the media created Clinton, the heroine, in 2016, and Trump, uh, the villain. Um, they are responsible for making him even bigger than he could have been by putting him in that underdog role. So underdog. they are basically to blame, you say. They were. They got. They destroyed themselves in their coverage of him, and they destroyed themselves by taking a side, which they did before in other elections. Of course, mm -hmm. the media has always been somewhat left-leaning and somewhat liberal, but this time, they took an active side where you would find opinions about the election in a headline, and all kind of neutrality, even the pretense of neutrality, was warped gone. into a kind of activism, an mm -hmm. activism to make sure Trump is not elected and to make sure Hillary, who, believe me, they had their problems with, but compared to Trump, they d didn't really care. Um, they were gonna do anything to get her, get her up there, and I think that was, I think people smelled that and that it was discussed and that it was kind of um, a problem for a lot of Americans. I wanted to ask you, didn't Wall Street make Trump president? Uh, didn't Deutsche Bank make him president? Interesting, that's a very good point. That could be true. For the media, yeah. I think Obama and, Cl and Clinton helped make him president. I think the states that she lost in. Mm -hmm. I think Obama made some terrible mistakes, and I think she made some mistakes by not going to those states that she lost in. But there's a very interesting idea that there was this crisis in Flint, a water crisis in Flint during 2015, where the water was kind of poisoned. And for some reason, Obama felt that he could go there and kind of fix this problem. And instead, he sided with the water companies and the government there, that everything was fine. He, there's even a shot of him tasting the water and saying, it's fine, it's drinkable, when for a year people have been complaining about the water. I think there were 90,000 fewer votes that w Trump won because, because of, of that, that, in that little segment of Michigan. And I do think, and, and you have to understand, Trump only won by 70,000 votes in terms of uh, electoral an electoral yeah. win. So I think it's a combination of things. It could be Deutschland, it could also be Obama, and it could also be people's reactions to Hillary. He was also very present. He, he ran an very excellent present. campaign. He, he ran went a great everywhere. campaign. And she just could not connect. True, she won the popular vote, let's face it. But she didn't, but she won by a lot less than people thought. And hmm. he won by a lot more, more than, than people the thought. people thought and the media thought. And we just have to deal with that. And I think there is this kind of fantasia that people have created, which resulted in the Mueller report that said, no, 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 it was a different thing. We can't. It's very hard for people to look at that election who are on the left and say, I can't believe that we blew it. It's a very, very painful thing. Just as it's a very painful thing for people to let go of the fact that Trump won and had completely erased everything Obama had done by the summer of, I don't know, 2018, yeah. 2017. It's a, it, it's a hard lesson. You call it a bubble, right? A liberal bubble. Um, also, uh, you're talking about elitist friends who are in that bubble and who look out of their mansion or their loft uh, in New York and are worth uh, 10 millions of dollars and they complain and you don't understand why they are complaining because their lives ha haven't probably radically changed over the last Well, they're three not going to be affected by whoever is president. They're not going to be affected by anything that happens. They are mm -hmm. completely left alone in terms of having a certain kind of power or privilege. Of course I tell them that, but it's hard to when they don't listen. Yeah. And it's a very difficult thing that the left has stopped listening to the other side, and that's dangerous. And I, what I detail in this is that my left-leaning friends and my liberal friends would not listen to someone else talking about from the, on the other side of the aisle. I think there was a poll done where it said that 90% of conservatives or right-leaning people would have they dinner would. with a left-leaning or liberal person. 8% of liberals would have that with it. And that is true. That is, yeah. that is a problem with this mindset of um, liberalism, neoliberalism now and how it's defined in the US. That is not how it works. Yeah, this is this is illiberal, becoming a lack of freedom, actually, a lack of trying to understand and grasp what somebody else thinks. And it's also, and this is also infecting academia, it's infecting the entertainment industry, it's affecting the media, this lack of empathy in terms of the other people's shoes, and that's be, putting yourself in the other people's shoes, and yeah. it's just, uh, it's, I don't know, I. It's got to end somewhere, I think, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. 
because you give the example, what was the University of Berkeley, where um, they cancelled a, a, a number of conservative speakers you know, that, and, and where students are demanding safe spaces? What is a safe look, space? Look, <laughs> uh, well, this was a big thing, and it was covered in the media. I don't believe it was an all-out 100% thing. I do not think stu college students are that stupid. I really don't think that at all. I think that the media logged on to this thing that was happening in 2016 and 2017 in American uh, uh, colleges where uh, students would protest someone who had a conservative or a right-leaning um, agenda, more or less, and were giving speeches on campus. And so they would have these things called safe spaces where they play happy music and then have balloons and cupcakes. and. <laughs> You could bring your, your puppy and pet the puppy just so you could calm down about the fact that there's safe space. And it's fair, and, and, but again, I have to say, I think the media logged on to a couple of things. Well, not a couple, it was happening. But um, hopefully that all blew up when the media could not even justify banning people from talking at colleges. And Berkeley itself was so embarrassed ultimately by, you yeah. know, what are we doing? We're banning people because we don't like Trump. We don't have speakers who, you know, whatever. But I yeah. think that's a, I think that's a thing of the past. And uh, I think college students are smarter than that now. Also very satiric, satirical and, and, and funny in the book is how um, I, could, I could relate to that, that when you give um, extensive comment about new films, new movies, and then say it's very hard, uh, for example, to criticize for aesthetical reasons, you can go into that, um, a movie that is about race, because it will be some uh, kind of way you are trying to hide the fact that you're actually a racist, Brett. And when it's a gay movie, then you will get the criticism that, oh, you're so full of self-hatred. Um, is that something that is increasing? When you don't like a movie with strong women in it, of course, you're a misogynist and anti-feminist, etc. Like these, this labeling, is that some, this something that happens to you in the Twitter atmosphere or uh, also outside? I think there is a pushback on that. For example, everyone uses the female Ghostbusters that was released a couple of summers ago as an example of, it seemed a studio was pushing a feminist ideology on this comedy that was uh, this remake of a much beloved comedy. Um, the fact is that it really wasn't good. And that was the problem. And people were saying it's not good. The people who complained it wasn't good then were labeled sexist and incels, do you know what incels are? It's a big thing in the United States. Most, most of the mass shooters are incels, which means they are an involuntary celibate. It means they can't get laid, they can't find women, and often they leave manifestos behind talking about how much they hate women anyway. So you're automatically an incel if you didn't like Ghostbusters. It's absurd. <laughs> It's absurd, but I do think that uh, the gay thing is changing. Uh, the, the gay characters have mostly disappeared from the big studio movies. I don't think Disney is putting gay characters in the Marvel movies yet, um, but, there is, but there is stuff happening. I thought it was a massive change, and I'm, we're still talking about uh, this uh, uh, gay global reaction in cinema. The fact that Bohemian Rhapsody, the Queen biopic, has made a billion dollars and is, I think, next to Titanic, uh, the highest grossing drama ever produced globally, had a gay man at the center of it. And a lot of people didn't really notice that. Uh, certainly Rocket Man, again, a biopic of a gay rock star, which was much more explicit. It was released in 3,000 theaters on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I think at last year's Academy Awards, I wrote about this, uh, there were seven, three of the people who won the Oscars, uh, actors, supporting actor, and actress, all played gay or bisexual characters. The difference is they were in movies where their gayness was folded into the narrative and the narrative was not about gayness. But this is also what you would prefer, right? Uh, like this is what I prefer. Movies. This yeah. is what I prefer. And also, I think Call Me By Your Name is an example of that too, which was just this kind of widescreen love story between two men that wasn't about bullying or AIDS or wasn't overly concerned with an ideology or a message. It was just a love story. It was about a guy who gets hurt by another guy. And it's just, it, it's a universal thing. It just was two, it just has two men in it. But I think it's different with um, certainly uh, movies about 
uh, people of color it is a problematic thing to criticize. I know that I criticized Black Panther on my podcast, and I was trolled by Black Twitter yeah. for four days. That's not fun to no. like have people tell you, "We're gonna come and get you, you fucking motherfucker!" You know, you fucking racist hick. I mean, nonstop because I said something about how black um, how Black Panther I think is being forced down our throats by Disney as a great movie for Oscars or something like that. Yeah. Boy, you cannot even say that. And, and no one went back to my podcast where I talked about how the most interesting thing about Black Panther was its blackness. Wakanda was an interesting place. Those opening images, I've never seen anything like that before. And then it just becomes a Marvel movie with like whatever the vibranium they have to find and the spaceships and the MMA fights. And it becomes something that's very, very Marvel. Um, mm -hmm. But and, and also people tend to forget that, that my, my favorite show on television is Atlanta, which I talk about a lot on my podcast, but oh no, it has to be the, you know. By so, certain people then, of course, and then in the uh, Twitter atmosphere mostly. But Twitter or, is toxic now. Yeah. Twitter is a simply toxic. But why don't you get, get, get off it then? Well, I can why promote do you my, stay on it? I can promote my podcast, <laughs> and then every now and then you can connect with people. I, yeah. The biggest tweet that I've ever, for, in 10 years, was a month ago where there was a special on Netflix, uh, a comedy special with Dave Chappelle. And it was an hour long thing, uh, a routine, a set of him going against everything that's PC in the culture. He defended Louis C.K. He said he doesn't believe the Michael Jackson kids who said they were molested by him. Uh, he, um, hates, uh, he hates Me Too. Uh, and he just gave this, like, you couldn't, you didn't have to agree with him. Some of it was funny, some of it wasn't. But it was like a, an explosion in American culture. People couldn't believe that someone was on stage for an hour speaking their mind. And that is, and so I tweeted, like, I think Dave Chappelle just saved America from itself. From itself. And uh, I lost a lot of people. <laughs> and then I gained a ton of people. And I've never had a tweet uh, be that... Uh, um, retweeted or liked or whatever. Um, but mostly it's to recommend movies and to promote, promote my podcast. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, a lot of people have gotten off it, so I don't know. Mm. I mean, what does the, what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of it? Have, have we lost maybe uh, a sense of irony? Are people nowadays more difficult about irony? Because you said at the beginning of this conversation, quite interestingly, it is also literal. Um, people take things so literally. You said that about Trump too. Don't take him literal because that is the biggest mistake you can make. Is irony gone? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, Hope yeah. you're not being ironical. Uh, yeah, I guess it is. I mean, there is with millennials a deep desire for, I think, for sincerity, uh, quote unquote, realness, whatever that is. And I, I don't know. I think that, that the, the notion of being ironic is a kind of Gen X thing. And that every generation rebels against the generation that preceded it. Certainly Gen X rebelled against boomer uh, narcissism and this utopian fantasy that the baby boomer generation had about itself. And they responded by being, as I said, cool, indifferent, nihilistic, violent, profane. Uh, reveling in a kind of negativity that the boomer generation really didn't believe in. They were much more aspirational. And I do think that the millennial generation is reacting against Gen X and going, we're tired of your ugliness and your fucking, you know, nihilism and fight club and American psycho and, uh, you know, making serial killers heroes and all of this junk. And they are responding with a kind of positivity and a kind of... Uh, optimism in a way, a kind of a kind of yearning for a utopia, which is all fine. It, it, it's that's all good, well and good. I just don't think it actually reflects the realities of what life is, which is that it's you know a hard road and yeah, but also it ends a lack badly. of sense of humor to that that can help you. You know, I don't know. Todd is funny, and a lot of his friends are funny. I think there is there is millennial humor. It's just. <laughs> It's just they can be, they can be. Yeah. It's just different from Dave Chappelle's. It's sort of like millennial humor is. God, what if everybody was a strawberry milkshake? 
Wouldn't that be funny if we were all strawberry milkshakes today and then the humor lies in that rather yeah. than in... That, that was a joke, yeah. That was a joke, yeah. Everyone is a strawberry milkshake. And, if, and you know, part of what makes things funny is about margin, marginalization, yeah. separating people and making fun of them for their individual traits. That's just funny. And I think one of the things that's remarkable in America, one of the only things left are these celebrity roasts that they have, which are pretty down and dirty, but you also have old and young people, black and white people, women and men in the audience laughing hysterically at these politically incorrect jokes. And, you know, that might be um, the last bastion. I think, though, it's changing. I do think that the Dave Chappelle show, which I maybe didn't make any ripples here because I don't think you're quite having this problem, is far more, um, is far more embraced than, say, Hannah Gadsby or hmm. Tignatero, who I don't even know if people here know who those comedians are, but who are kind of dour, very politically correct, ideological feminist comics that aren't very funny. But I, ju I, I just read about the Chappelle uh, show yeah, earlier. This is funny you, you, you mention it. Um, you just came from France, I believe, today. Paris. Paris, yes. Yeah. Um, there is, um, you, you tell the story of um, the Penn Award and a group of, I'd, 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 like, to, I'd like you to, to, to tell us what happened there, that a group of American writers um, objected to, what was it, a Freedom of Press Award for the people of Charlie Hebdo um, after the attacks, and you uh, vehemently opposed them opposing uh, Charlie Hebdo getting uh, the award. What, what was going on there? Uh, America. America, yeah. the, the American left, the progressive left is going on there. This kind of progressive nihilism. I, 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 I can't understand it. The Charlie Hebdo massacre encouraged Penn, which is a, a huge organization for writers in the US, and they ha give an award ceremony every year as they've done for, I don't know what, 50 years now. Um, they decided to give the surviving members of Charlie Hebdo massacre the Freedom of Expression Award. They actually created the award that year, particularly for that incident. Fantastic, great, freedom of expression. You might not like Charlie Hebdo, it might not be your thing, but still the fact that it's, you know, it is outrageous that 12 people are murdered because yep. Islamic people are offended by the cartoons in, in this thing. A group of writers, about 200 of them, decided to boycott <clears throat> the event and asked um, the organization to um, take the award away because what it was doing, giving the award to Charlie Hebdo, was furthering um, making fun of marginalized people and um, that we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, the satire against Islam, against Muslims, whatever. Um, I never saw giving that award to Charlie Hebdo as anything specific. It was just on a principle mm. that you should be able to, in our society, say what you want, express what you want within, without getting murdered. Without getting murdered. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was it. You didn't have to like Charlie Hebdo to give them the award, but these writers had nuanced this to death, and it opened a door that suggested, well, what else can't you say? What else can't you make fun of? I mean, that is the problem with free speech, and everyone needs to know. Make fun of everything or make fun of nothing. Laugh at everything or laugh at nothing. I mean, that's the problem when you start censoring or self-censoring yourself in a society where a, a minority usually, it is usually the minority, doesn't like something. They don't mm -hmm. like a painting. They don't want you to see a painting. So instead of not looking at it, they want it taken down, or they want a movie canceled, or they want this... And, and that is, again, the difference w with the left I grew up with and the left that exists now. So laughing at everything or laughing at... Nothing. Nothing. Th this is what you... Look, if we have free speech... If not, it's censorship. If we have, yeah, I, it is. And if we have free speech in the United States, that means you have to deal with the Westboro Baptist Church who, you know, says horrible things about gay people at their funerals and shit with, you know, um, placards. And it, it's just... An, it, you, in a free speech society, you have to deal with whatever the good and the bad is. Hmm. 
then we start getting into a very gray area, this maze of, well, where does it stop when you start saying you can't say that, you can't do that? And it is happening in the United States. I mean, I think there are channels that don't show certain John Hughes movies because the uh, uh, fag is used as a term uh, that when teenagers make fun of themselves. Certainly Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles, which is a movie about a black sheriff and deals with race, is being not shown on certain channels. And there seems to be a list of movies by even directors that aren't being shown because of whatever their political ideology might have been. You know, John Ford is looked at as the enemy. I don't know where this kind of uh, censorious attitude about art, or not looking at it within the context of the time it was made, I don't know where it's leading us. Where it's leading is, for example, that since this summer, the New York Times is not publishing any more cartoons. They took the cartoons away, at least in the international edition, I believe. That's so childish. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, some of the, the cartoon... cartoonist got fired after working there for 20 years because and that, of for a, a really cartoon dumb by somebody cartoon. else. And, for well, a really and dumb it, was cartoon. Written, it was drawn by somebody else. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we are. You like it? It's good? Are you happy about that? Yeah, I'm happy. But but is that is it something new, uh, Brett? Is it an evolution that wasn't there before? Like, was do we it? know that there weren't movies that weren't shown on certain channels in America before? Uh, no. No. Uh, no. No, I believe that we do know that everything was basically being shown and things were not looked at through this ideological lens. Yes, yeah. I believe this is a new thing. And, and it's going happening. very rapidly uh, downhill? I don't, know. Uh, um. I don't know. I mean, you do hear... I mean, I hear um, young people today talking about Taxi Driver like it's a movie that glorifies incels. Why are you showing it? I read, I read essays by millennials in America talking about how horrifying Heathers is. And they can't believe Heathers is being shown on a cable channel like HBO or Showtime because it glorifies um, sexual assault, uh, it makes fun of gay dudes, it is uh, about, it, it glorifies school shootings. And well, yeah, that's part of what's fun about it. That's part of what's funny about the movie. It's a black comedy about all of these things. So that is happening. Now, I do think that there is pushback on that. It's not accepted. People are going, okay, this mm. is too much. So I, I am not completely, uh, feel completely hopeless about this America. idea. About America. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel completely hopeless about America, no. Um, We're uh, just going uh, through some shit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a fun part I, I recognize a lot is the, the, the story about um, and then Yelp came into our lives and we started raiding Everything, restaurants, buses, uh, do you guys taxi, do it here? Dry. Yeah, yeah, we do it too. And then you get raided back. I just found out that in America <laughs> that I got raided back at Airbnb because I complained about a heater, and uh, then I was the most impossible guest ever. So that happened to me <laughs> in America. I didn't know you could get yes. rated back. Um, the reputation economy uh, uh, is, of course, uh, a nice uh, term. We worry so much about our our likability online and our social media profiles and everything has to be fun, cool and innocent. Is that also a new thing, a new trend? I don't know. I think what's different now is that we have the, the capability to display our lives, to be these exhibitionistic human beings that can show our lives to everybody else. And I do think that ultimately we want to show a much more positive <clears throat> and a much more, um, a side that makes people perhaps envious, a little jealous. I know that my boyfriend's sister has been having some problems in her marriage, and I hear her talk about them with my uh, partner every morning, he, she calls him up, and sometimes she's crying. And she's got two kids, and then Todd will come into my office 10 minutes after getting off the phone with her, and his girl, his his sister will have posted a picture of herself on Twitter, on Instagram, smiling with her two kids, going, "Beautiful morning in Chicago," and I know that's not really what's happening. Yeah. And I do think that that is uh, maybe not all the time, but that is <clears throat> you can do that, you can do that. 
Um, so I don't know what that means necessarily, but that's you, an example. You don't have that feeling when you go on Twitter yourself, huh? Uh, late at night, you don't have the feeling you have to be likable to, to everyone. I never did, and that's what got me into trouble. <laughs> I never did. But I you just do like it on said, purpose to a certain extent. Uh, to provoke. But I never, I saw Twitter as something, as a provocation. As many people have gotten into horrible trouble for being provocateurs on Twitter, everyone from James Gunn, who was the director of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, who got fired from Disney because of 10-year-old tweets, to Roseanne Barr, to whoever. I mean, I got, I've gotten into trouble a couple of times because of tweets that I've put out there. But we're old school in a way, and we saw Twitter as that's what it was used for. And now it's being weaponized against people. And, you know, 10-year-old tweets, 5-year-old tweets, Kevin Hart, his old tweets about, you know, gay jokes and stuff are... Now grounds for getting you canceled. The, uh, the likability online um, and, and us worrying so much about online reputations, um, is it too far stretched to, um, it was something that came to mind when I was reading it, to go to the social scores of, of China. There the government uh, keeps scores on how you behave, how uh, you answer if you pay your taxes on time, etc. Like where... Uh, could this in an apocalyptic, like if, if you could, um, if you would do a novel about it, about the likability and the reputation economy, um, oh. would our society evolve in that direction or? You know what, that would be a very ideological novel. <laughs> and I don't know how I could take that and turn it into a book that's about style and aesthetics. And I'm also not sure if the novel is the way to carry the message forward anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the novel for me is, uh, it's, it's a great medium. I love novels. I read them all the time. I'm carrying five around with me on this trip. But I don't know as a writer if I can use the novel as a way of saying what I want to say. I mean, I have a podcast, so the podcast, which very few people listen to, but it's a way for me to talk about what I want to talk about within a context, unlike Twitter or unlike yeah. a lot of places yeah. on social media. So that to me is kind of the new novel. I don't have mm. I don't have the audience that I would have with novels, but I also feel that that and um, other mediums, like I want to make a movie and I uh, whatever. There's other things that I, other ways that I want to deal with whatever is going on in the world, yeah. and I'm not sure the novel right now is the way to do it. So there will be no more novels. Uh, you, you start saying that you think about writing a novel and it turns into a nonfiction book. Um, what, what does it tell us uh, about the future or the near future? Will you be expressing your message mainly through nonfiction then? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I am thinking about doing, uh, or I've been asked to do a sequel to this book and I've been thinking about doing a, a book that's much more about film and movies mm -hmm. and how they've influenced my life. Because some of the fi people's favorite passages in this are really passages about movies and how I talk about how they've influenced me, how they've affected me. Um, and I think I wanted more of that in this book. My editor was afraid that people hadn't seen some of the movies I was talking about and it would ruin the flow of the that book. That is a risk, of course. I like, right. Yeah. So, and, I, and I really miss the fact that I don't have some of those chapters in here. But anyway, so I'm thinking about doing that. I'm also thinking about writing a book for audible.com, which would be a book that you listen to and not necessarily read. And you'd write it as a, form, a kind of monologue for someone else to read. I think that's a really, that's, that's blowing up in the United States right now. I think audible books are like way higher in terms of sales than uh, adult literary fiction is right now. And so I, I'm thinking about that. And I am, I mean, I have to say, I haven't written a book in 10 years, and writing White was a literary experience, even though I did pull stuff from my podcast. I did pull stuff from uh, pieces that I've written uh, five, six, seven years ago and put them into this one essay. And it did make me think about this book that I was thinking about working on even before I wrote Imperial Bedrooms, which I, a book I didn't, never thought that I was going to write. I thought Lunar Park was my, my final novel. And I now am, there was a little bit of a desire to go back to this book that I've been thinking about since 2008 that is, that precedes less, uh, it's before Less Than Zero. It takes place in high school in like 1980. And it doesn't have any of the cast of Less Than Zero. It's a completely separate thing. 
And I, and I think as I get older, I want to revisit that world and write about it. And so, of you know, the early who knows? years, let's say, yeah. yeah Young people yeah. In, uh, yeah. In, in LA. And, and not have it be so necessarily about the decadence of the less than zero era, which is three or four years with older kids, but with younger kids. I don't know. I don't know. I'm in a, I'm in a tran tran so transitory yeah. period right now. The, uh, the title, White, um, I read, I don't know if it's correct that the working title was different, that it was a white privileged male. That was the title. That yeah. was it, yeah. So should we interpret it like that or is it, is it white because of that or is it also white, what we were discussing, the likability, everything has to be nice, innocent and no stains on anything. What, 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 what is the, 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 the layered meaning to you? When I put the book together, um, I was thinking of the White Album by Joan Didion. I don't know if Joan Didion is that well known here in Brussels. No, she's not. She's a great American essayist, maybe my favorite nonfiction writer. And she wrote a fantastic collection of essays published in 1979 that is my favorite collection of essays called The White Album. And they're essays about California, about the end of the 60s, about living through the 70s in California, about a wider range of topics. It doesn't really matter. The writing is so fantastic that you are bolted to the page because of her prose. So this was my first nonfiction, and my editor was asking me for a title. And I said, well, I want something like Joan Didion, who was very big in the United States. She's very, very famous. I said, I want something like Joan Didion. I want something like The White Album. And he said, well, come up with something because we're trading these files back and forth and I want a title for it, a working title. And so I came up with White Privileged Male because these are the, the, you know, the ruminations of a white privileged male. There's no way getting around that. And it was kind of a dig about identity politics as well. My editor ultimately said that's way too jokey a title. I don't like it. I think this book is about neutrality. It's about looking at something and not coloring it super black or super pink or anything. It's about looking at life in a clear-eyed, very neutral way. And I think get rid of the privilege, get rid of the male, and just call it white. It will probably trigger some people, and if it does, then you've done your job. Mm -hmm. Because white should not trigger people. White should not make people freak out that the book is called white. And if in our current climate it does, and it has triggered people, and people have gotten mad that the book is called white, well, then its point has been proven yeah, in the yeah. title alone that this is how people react to things now in our culture. What were the reactions to that then? Like the, the negative but, reactions to white, what was the issue then that people uh, took? The issue was without people reading it, thinking that it was kind of this right-wing, alt-right <laughs> manifesto that was completely like conservative and whatever. And I really, when you read this book and you read about you know, everything from, you know, my boyfriend having problems finding a job to me, my obsession with Richard Gere in the early 80s. I American don't, Gigolo, yeah. I, I, don't, I did remember that one. I don't think, and my love of horror movies as a boy, I don't think it's going to appeal to any alt-right groups at all. It's, it's too gay. I mean, I think that's part of the problem. Though alt-right is kind of gay, too. It is. Why is that? Uh, I don't know. There's this subset of kind of homoerotic machismo going on. It's actually kind of hot, I think. And so so, I, uh, so, so I actually, Stephen Bannon is a gay icon? Uh, not Stephen Bannon. You'd have to go... Uh, well, Stephen Bannon is not a gay icon, but I, there's other various anonymous figures that you see pictures of on uh, social media that you go, oh, quite attractive. And then you read how horrible they are, and you go, well, well still attractive. I don't know. <laughs> Still quite hot, even though he wants to kill everybody and, yeah. yeah. But white privileged male and the way uh, it came to this title is, is a very interesting story. It made me think, like, as a, as, as a wrap-up of when we were discussing humor, satire, and can you laugh at everything? Of course, what minorities find hard is when the majority keeps making fun of them. Like, you could also say that sense of humor, of true irony or humor is... is against the more strong, the stronger, and not the weaker. No? Uh, I <laughs> guess. I mean, I think that, you know, it's... Look, all 
all humor stems from uh, pain. A lot of humor stems from things not working out, mm -hmm. things getting fucked up. That's the essence of comedy. And it is, it's in every tribe, there have been jokes about the faults of that particular tribe, whether it's Asian comics, black comics, uh, now, gay comics, I mean, there, there's always been a kind of self-reflexive jokiness about our own problems. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. And humor is a way to kind of lessen the pain, in a way, of these problems that we all go through. I mean, so I don't know. I think it's, I, I'm not offended by gay jokes. I never have been offended by gay jokes. Um, I... I know there are gay men who are offended by gay jokes, who are white and privileged like I am. I think that's uh, a little uptight, and I think that humor is humor. Comedy is comedy. You're not giving a speech of the United Nations. You're telling jokes. You're telling jokes. And I think when people get offended by jokes or about comedy, then they're really missing the point, and they're probably quite humorless and not and not 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 taking the jokes in the spirit in which they're they're they being supposed. offered yeah. and so that's a bit of a problem okay <laughs> now you could you could end by by making a joke no i don't know i don't know i don't have a joke but i um i uh i don't know i don't know the word is, is yours for the last final word, if you want to well, uh, wrap this up with a conclusion without giving everything away, because we talked a lot look, about the book. I so. mean, I am, look, I don't feel that I'm here to have to force anybody to buy a book or to sell a book, so I, I don't know if I can do that. Um, but I, uh, this book is, it's, it's basically a part memoir, part, uh, part memoir and part, um, uh, movie criticism, I talk a lot about movies, uh, I don't know, I mean it's, uh, might be interesting to some of you, might not be interesting to some of you, feel free to get it or not get it, but I think that I will be, um, I will be signing the book, or any other books that you have brought, this is my first time in Brussels, so I, if you have old books, that's fine as well. How come well. only the first time in Brussels, that's uh, I don't after know. a long time. I have that's... no idea why it's the first time in Brussels. Um, it might be my last time in Brussels. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see well, how it we goes. We are glad you squeezed us in at the last moment. So. I am happy to have come. So I feel that we're kind of leaving this on a kind of like down note that it could be a little bit more You can lift upbeat. it up. Be my guest. I, I don't... Oh, there's someone who's very excited. Um, <clears throat> uh, oh, this is too much pressure. But... Uh, Anyway, I'm glad that we did this. <laughs> I think it was relatively, got a little serious, but I think it was good. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, I think we're going to go backstage, and then we'll be in front signing books. So I hope to see you guys there. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>